I'm Andy Smith. I'm pleased to welcome you to Clementine Paddleford, America's first uh, food journalist. Uh, before I introduce our illustrious panel, uh, I would like to tell you a bit about uh, the New Schools Food Studies Program and the food series that we have uh, here at the New School called Culinary Luminaries. As some of you know, the New School has actually offered courses in food studies for almost three decades. Uh, in the midst of this, in 19, uh, excuse me, in uh, 2008, we began a full-fledged uh, program on food studies with formal courses that are uh, given for a year, others that are given for short periods of time, and Saturday workshops. Uh, part of the food studies program uh, that we have here is a, a large number of events, of which this is one of. Our culinary luminary uh, series has had uh, five uh, previous sessions. Uh, one on James Beard, one on um, MFK Fisher, one on Julia Child, one on Joseph Baum, and one on Craig Claiborne. Uh, they are all on YouTube. Uh, if you check very carefully, if you've missed one, I'm sure none of you missed any of them. You've all been here. Uh, if you happen to have missed one, uh, all I can do is say you can go on YouTube and see each of the presentations that we've had before. We will be doing more events next year. Uh, we're looking for suggestions and ideas, so if you have them, please do come up to us and talk with us about them. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, we will be uh, filming this one, which means the following. You need to turn off your cell phones. Even if you think you already turned it off, check it. Uh, second, um, there will be a period of time at the end where people can uh, ask uh, questions or make comments. Are there some of you who, have, who knew Clementine Paddleford? You've got to raise your hands nice and high. See, uh, Kelly wants to get your names down later on. Now, technically, um, uh, uh, I would like to give you an opportunity, if you wish to, to make a few comments before we have questions about Clementine. You, not, no one's required to do that, but I, if you would like to do so after the panelists finish, uh, I think we would appreciate that. So how many of you uh, have never heard anything about Clementine Paddleford before this session? How many of you are students that currently have your hand up? <laughs> we have a wonderful panel um, of uh, four people. We have given you a program with uh, detailed um, biographical information on them. Our first speaker will be Kelly Alexander. Uh, she formerly was the senior editor at Savour. Uh, she's currently a writer based in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. She authored the a critically acclaimed biography, Hometown Appetites, the story of Clementine Paddleford, the forgotten food writer who chronicled how America ate. We just happen to have extra copies back there of the book. I'm sure that all of you have your copies, but just in case you don't, or just in case you would like uh, Kelly to autograph them, she has consented to do so after the session is over. Uh, our second speaker is Betsy Wade. Uh, her career began at the Herald Tribune where she worked in women's news with Clementine Paddleford. She worked at the New York Times for 45 years, and today she's a freelance writer and editor. Our third uh, speaker will be Coleman Andrews. Uh, he is the former restaurant columnist for the Late Gourmet magazine. Uh, he was a co-founder of Savura magazine uh, and for uh, four years was the editor-in-chief. Uh, he has uh, a number of books. I figured eight by my count that have been published. So many, he can't keep track of them. <laughs> Um, and uh, his latest book, which he just happens to have a preview copy of, it's Ferran, The Inside Story of El Bulli, The Man Who Reinvented Food. Uh, you'll have to come back next year when the book is out in order to get copies of it. This is, I guess, the or, only... Or pre-order on Amazon. Or pre-order on Amazon. He happens to have brought forms for that purpose. Yeah, no, is that right? No. Uh, I, know, I, know the, I know the URL, though. You know, just know the URL if you need that. Uh, he also had just completed a book, The Country Cooking of Italy, which will be released in the fall of next year. Uh, Molly O'Neill, I think we've seen you someplace before. Was it here in this room for three other sessions? Is this <laughs> the third one? Uh, Molly O'Neill is a journalist and author of three award-winning uh, cookbooks and a memoir, Mostly True, um, which if you haven't read, it's mostly true based on my knowledge on it, so it's all I can say. Uh, and she also... Uh, has completed uh, editing of a wonderful book called American Food Writing, which all in my food writing class, where are you, those in my food writing class, I have encouraged to acquire. Uh, so if you wish to acquire this and have Molly sign it, she too has consented to do so, only if you ask nicely. So that's it. 
Uh, she has completed, she, may, ha, she has completed, she is in the process of completing, she says she has the manuscript in her car, which bothers me a lot, uh, but uh, she claims that she has the manuscript in the car, that it will be out in October, is that correct, for That's her right. latest book, which is, she's worked on for 10 years, this is a 10-year process, uh, titled One Big Table, Many Americans, Many Meals. Uh, so we look forward to that, and we'll hopefully in, uh, have you come back to, to talk about that if you're not too busy in the fall to come back here. Um, uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to Kelly. Do you want to come up here, or you would like to speak there? I'm going to come. I'm going to come. stand. I'm like that. Just, just that kind of thing. Not a problem. Thanks. So wait a minute. Who said they knew Clementine Paddleford? I'm sorry to be repetitive, but I, I, I have to know. Who knew her? Who knew Clementine Paddleford? <laughs> this woman, that woman, and there was one in the back. Okay, well, I'll... I'm Carol Groff. When I was in college, I was told, studying food, that Clementine Paddleford was the one who introduced us to Clementine Paddleford. And she was the Excuse me, uh, Carol, hold one minute. Can you uh, speak into the microphone? If not, we don't get it on the film. Uh, and we would like you to give your names when you ask a question or make a statement. So go ahead. Can you start over again? Start over. Thank okay. you. <laughs> we'll take it from the top. When I was in college, I was told I should read the Times and the Tribune every Wednesday, which I did. I graduated, I became assistant food editor, good housekeeping, and I clipped and I clipped and I clipped. But then Brian Brock was born, and I went to the incinerator, and I took all my Clementine material. It was either him or her. So I loved going to press parties and seeing Clem there, you know, she had a problem and would always put her finger over her throat to speak. And I was completely in awe that she flew a plane in and she always had her own plane. She flew it. She, she had her typewriter with her and would just type away madly. She was a great glad girl and I'm so glad that we're finally recognize her as the first food journalist. I'm looking at you with amazement because I became very interested in Clementine Paddleford almost 10 years ago. And at that time, my editor, who is right there, told me that he wouldn't um, print my article about Clementine unless I could find one person alive who knew her. <laughs> I thought it was really cruel because I had the worst time doing it. And I did. I found Cecily Brownstone. Does anybody know who that is? She was 96. She was the food editor for the Associated Press for decades. And she talked to me about Clementine. And she was very irritated that I wasn't writing a book about her. Someone else did. <laughs> and they did a very good job. But um, when Andy Smith told me there will be people in the audience who knew Clementine, I said there will not. So you proved him right. And it was very nice to hear your story. Um, Clementine Paddleford is a very easy person to fall in love with. Easy. Easy even for me. And I have to say, I definitely didn't start out to be a biographer. To be a really good biographer, I think you have to be a person who is small in the face of history and who is willing to subjugate him or herself to the subject. And I never thought I was that type of writer. But what I was was somebody who was very interested in food history. And so how I met Clementine was through this book, How America Eats. This is my copy of How America Eats. It was published in 1960. She wrote it between 1948 and 1960. Um, I collect used cookbooks. And my husband was on a business trip. And he brought this home. And I was very annoyed because I like to pick out my own used cookbooks. And I would have preferred something else. So he, um, he left it on our table, and I pushed it away, and he pushed it back, and I pushed it away. And one day, I finally opened it after he said, are you ever going to open that? 
And this is the first words I read. It said, this book has been 12 years in the writing. It was in January 1948. I started crisscrossing the United States as roving food editor for This Week magazine. My assignment was to tell how America eats. I have traveled by train, plane, automobile, by muleback, on foot, in all over 800,000 miles. I have ranged from the lobster pots of Maine to the vineyards of California, from the sugar shanties of Vermont to the salmon canneries in Alaska. I have collected these recipes from a wide variety of kitchens, farm kitchens, apartment kitchenettes, governor's mansions, hamburger diners, tea rooms, and from the finest restaurants with great chefs in charge. I have eaten with crews on fishing boats and enjoyed slum gullion at a hobo convention. Okay, so that's what I first read, and I was amazed. I put the boat down, and I couldn't believe that as a student of food history and an editor of a food magazine, I had never heard of Clementine Paddleford before, and I didn't know why. So I took my book into the office of my editor, and I said, um, have you ever heard of Clementine Paddleford before? And he said, uh, yeah, but I don't know much. And I had this book, and I said, she did all these amazing things, and why don't I know her name? And I went on the internet, and I discovered that she had left her archives to Kansas State University, which was actually a really great thing for me, because it's really cheap to get to Manhattan, Kansas, and most of my colleagues really wanted to go to places like Paris and Tokyo and London. <laughs> and so my boss said, sure, go to Manhattan, Kansas, knock yourself out, see what you can learn about Clementine Paddleford. And it ended up being the assignment that changed my life, because when I got to Manhattan, Kansas, I found American food. I found boxes and boxes and boxes filled with newspaper reports that basically defined regional American food before it existed. Um, one of the things that Clementine wrote in her in her introduction that spoke to me, that really called to me, that made me want to go to Manhattan, Kansas so much, was this. She says, how does America eat? She eats on the fat of the land. She eats in every language. For the most part, however, even with the increasingly popular trend toward foreign foods, the dishes come to the table with an American accent. The pioneer mother created dishes with foods ava available. These we call regional. It is these, perhaps, I've given the greatest emphasis. However, I'm not given to food favorites, hold no food prejudices. Good food is good food wherever you find it. Many of these recipes were salvaged from batter-splashed, handwritten notebooks. The great majority had never been printed until they appeared in This Week magazine. They're word of mouth hand downs from mother and daughter. So she says that more often over the years, what American food means is a cuisine that is mixed and Americanized. And it spoke so much to me personally because I grew up in a very mixed and Americanized house. I grew up as a Jewish person in the Deep South, and I understood mixed and Americanized right away. I understood what it was like to have a dinner table that had cream corn and chopped liver at the same meal. I got it, and I understood that it was a peculiar time in food writing. Before we got together here, the panelists were all discussing where we are in food writing and people who had come before, and we were talking about Craig Claiborne, and we were talking about Clementine, and when I was coming up, and Molly and Coleman were talking about when they were coming up, when I was coming up, there was a distinct sort of movement in food writing that is still there. It was very confessional. It was all about the writer. It was all very rhapsodic, and there were stories, and you can still read them, that began with stuff like, the first time I ever tasted a plum pie, and as a food writer, I was not very interested in that approach. What I was very interested in was regional American food. I was very interested in Clementine Paddleford and a writer who was a reporter, who was not about flourish, although she was a very florid writer. It wasn't about herself. The writing was about where she was. So a typical Clementine Paddleford column might have started out, here I am at the governor's mansion in Indianapolis, Indiana, and the governor makes the very best the governor's wife, it would have been, made the very best chicken and dumplings I've ever tasted, and she shared the recipe only before with her eight daughters-in-laws, and here it is. Daughters-in-law, sorry, Betsy. Um, that was the kind of food writing that spoke to me because what it was about was not the writer. It was about regional American food and how it got that way. And I became very, very interested in Clementine's archive when I got to Kansas State. And what I really wanted to do was bring back that sort of food writing, was um, have people think more about where food came from than the person who was writing about it. 
part of the reason why I thought that that was important was because we hear the term regional American food now all the time. It's like a buzzword. It's like a catchphrase. It's like one of those things you hear on TV all the time, regional American food. You know, I watch the television program Top Chef. A lot of you probably watch it too. If I ever have to hear the term flavor profile again, I think I'm going to throw up. It's like doesn't mean anything. It's a big buzzword. And I feel like regional American food has become that way too. And regional American food is actually a really lovely concept. It talks about how immigrants got here and they couldn't find what they needed to make their food and they had to adapt with what they found. And Clementine was the very first person I ever read who chronicled that. And I thought it was really important. I liked her style. It was really straightforward. It was really breezy. It was really not about herself. It was really about the food and about the people who made it. It was about how a Hungarian family had gotten to Cleveland and what they were using to make their goulash. That to me was really great food writing. It wasn't about flavor profiles. I watched an episode of Top Chef recently where one of the contestants said, I just want to make it regional. <laughs> I'm not really sure how you could just make something regional, right? <laughs> That's how you can make it regional. You can be Hungarian and you can move to Cleveland and you can figure out how you're going to make goulash and how you're going to find paprika. That's how you can do it. And that's what Clementine was very concerned about. She was very concerned with the fact that the oral tradition was disappearing, the way that women shared recipes with each other, the way that mothers taught daughters their family recipes, the way that neighbors passed recipes over their picket fences was going away. We were industrializing, women were going to work, and there was no way that people could share recipes in that easy way again. And what she wanted to do in her column was provide this really amazing recipe swap so that wherever you were, if you were in Atlanta, you could find out how to make that goulash and you could share recipes with other people and you could figure out how to make it regional all by yourself in your own kitchen. What she did was give this marvelous vicarious experience to all of her readers. And so what I did was go to Kansas and look at this archive and try to figure out what I might do about it. And I started writing about Clementine and trying to bring her back in a certain way so that we could understand again what regional American food really was. Um, when I got to Kansas, and one of the things I'm supposed to tell you about is who Clementine was. So Clementine, when I got to Kansas, I learned she was a farm girl. She grew up in a town called Stockdale, Kansas that has long since been flooded out of existence. It's outside of Manhattan. Her mother was that kind of pioneer, sort of heroine mother who cooked everything. She was the kind of woman who, Clementine called her her rock of Gibraltar, who brought everybody together, all the people who worked on the farm with dinner. Clementine's favorite story of growing up was, it was her ninth birthday party. She wanted to have fried chicken. She had everybody in the neighborhood all the other farm children over. They made a big, her mother made a big platter of fried chicken and mashed potatoes and greens and homemade biscuits and big, big pitchers of lemonade. And Clementine was so excited, she came running into the dining room and she knocked over the crystal pitcher of lemonade all over all of the table and ruined the whole spread. And the mother just said, that's all right, and made it all over again. That was the, the most important memory that Clementine Paddleford had of her childhood. That was how food brought people together and that was how you stayed true in those moments when life was trying for you. So that's where she came from. She had come from this sort of stock of really strong women who knew how to take care of business. And the business that she wanted to take care of was writing. She was that kind of annoying little child who's always walking around with a notebook. And I say that because I was that kind of child. And what she did was sit at her train depot and make lists of who was coming and who was going and get in other people's business like any good reporter. And what Clementine wanted most to do was to tell stories. When she moved to New York after she graduated from college in the 20s, this wasn't a great time in history to be a female reporter. She decided the only way she could get into a newspaper was to write about one of two things, shoes or food, clothes or food, right? And she knew more about food, so it wasn't really a decision. But what she was up against was a very serious home ec background. Newspaper food sections at that time the late, great R.W. Apple Jr. put it best, said we're paid for almost entirely by advertisers. So you'd have a company out of Chicago like Armor Meat who would pay for the entire food section. They would buy the ads. They would give you a coupon for the roast. They would do almost everything but come and cook it for you. And what newspaper food editors did was make recipe formulas. 
And so Clementine's great genius was to walk into that situation and see that there was a whole lot of room for much better storytelling. She really believed that the people who made the recipes were far more interesting than the recipes themselves, and she was damn right about it. She made a huge career out of doing that. She had, in her day, how many readers? 12 million readers, something unbelievable. She was a Time Magazine Person of the Year in 1953. At one point, she was the highest paid woman in the country. As a newspaper food reporter, her genius was that she understood that the people who made the food were more interesting than the recipes. It came as second nature to her because that's how she'd grown up. So that's really who she was. If you take away nothing else from this talk, that's what I sort of want people to understand is that there is such a thing as region, regional American food and there was such a woman who was doing it long before it was something that was on television. Um, I always feel uncomfortable talking so much about Clementine without you getting to hear her. So I'm going to close because there's a lot more to say and a lot of other people who are more eloquent than I am are going to say it, but I'm going to give you a little taste of Clementine. This is one of my most favorite columns that she ever wrote. So Clementine tried for 10 years to get aboard the USS Skipjack, which was for a time the fastest nuclear submarine in the world. It was docked in Connecticut and she had been appealing to the government for 10 years to let her on board and what she wanted to do, of course, was to find out how the submarine cooks fed all those men. So they finally let her do it. And this is some lines from that column. It was published in the New York Herald Tribune and then in This Week magazine in a different version in July of 1960. So here she goes. She said, I had asked for it, a dive to the ocean floor. The wind rushed at me like a mad bull. I clung to a one rope rail, walked the narrow ramp from State Pier, New London, Connecticut to the curved top of a mighty whale. It looked like a whale, but it was a different kind of fish. The naval cadets all smiling and greeting her, oh, I'm sorry. I'd come aboard to see how America eats in what the crew called our underwater hotel. I was clothed in darkness and in goose flesh. Who cares, I thought to myself, what men eat on submarines. Then she says, um, the Navy chefs showed her around these tight quarters and passageways. They had a kitchen that was six by nine feet. It was a capsule kitchen. And so they let her in it. She said, everything is compressed, even flour, always a bulky item aboard a ship. It's been compressed to one-fourth its normal volume without a loss of quality. A one-pound can of dehydrated orange juice crystals, which will reconstitute to one-gallon beverage with a space saving of 75%. It is packed in sacks, weighted down, put in a projector like a miniature torpedo tube, and fired out to the fish. I love this column. I think it really is a testimony to her, a testament to Clementine's ingenuity. She answers every question a reader didn't know he had about culinary life on a submarine. The two recipes that she picked to use, she said, are in quantity amounts with the thought that these might be useful when planning a community meal. <laughs> there are brownies to feed 80 and hamburger pie for 100. Whether or not her readers ever put those mammoth recipes to use, they had to admire her willingness to go to any lengths to report on food. So I hope you all enjoy Clementine as much as I have. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, do you, Betsy, you want to sit down? I'll just stay okay. sitting. Am I, am I on the mic now? Can you hear me? No. Can we do this? Horrors. Okay. All right, so I'm on the mic, and I can talk to you, and I don't have to shout. Uh, I think the most interesting line that Kelly has just given us is about Clem's not starting the article about the first time I ever ate thus and such. Uh, it would be unthinkable, and I'm sure Ms. Roth and the other women who knew Clem would certify that she was a very private person. And she was not about to tell you any of those things that were part of her private life. And that, I think, is what made her such a wonderful reporter for going out and talking to other people. She knew how to make people feel comfortable. She knew how to make them feel at ease. And then what do you do and how many cups of that do you put in? But Clem was not telling you about Clem. And I worked with her and I had not only had a letter to the managing editor of the Herald Tribune uh, saying, here's this nice kid, you should give a job. I also had a letter to Clementine Paddleford from one of her childhood friends in Chicago saying, my husband's friend is coming to work for you, and perhaps you would uh, look with kindness upon her. And indeed she did, but she never told me what she was doing. Uh, 
I suddenly discovered that when she went away for weekends or weeks and the Friday column, which was the market day column, that could not be written in advance because you had to call up the New York Department of Commerce and find out what bananas were going for that week and what the price of a dozen brown eggs was, I was the one who was going to do that, and I was going to get the byline on that, and I wrote Clementine Paddleford's column on Friday afternoons when she was gone. Well, I thought, you know, something very strange had happened, but what had happened was that Clem was looking out for the children of her friends from Chicago. But you never knew that. You never had any way to find that kind of thing out because she was out there reporting and scuffling all the time. Uh, and as Ms. Roth pointed out, Clem did not have a voice in the sense that you and I have a voice. Uh, she had a mechanical device, and she would speak by exhaling. And anybody who knows about this kind of thing knows that at one point, remember the Bromo Seltzer commercials? Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer. They were trying to give Clem two devices to hold here that would make more of a sound for her. Uh, but she didn't want that. So she has a black ribbon around her neck and a little silver device that covers the hole in her esophagus, I guess it is. My anatomy is not perfect. And she would put her finger there in order to speak of it. And if you can imagine making your living by interviewing people, both on the phone and in person with no voice, you know what kind of guts this woman had. And she never, never flinched in any of these things as she went forward. So of course, when I arrived green as grass, fresh out of school, uh, I was, you know, kind of looking this way. And they said, well, you know, never mind. Clem had a bright, blighted love affair. And she drank some acid in the school lab one day. And I said, well, that's a very curious undertaking. Of course, that is not true. But Clem didn't make, waste any time with anybody telling them it wasn't true. What Kelly did was Kelly was able to get hold of the actual documents, including some letters about her cancer operation very early in her life, and she did not turn back. Uh, she just kept on going and doing what she was going to do, but that was her private life. She wasn't going to tell you how she got that way. And also, as for the blighted love affair, she, she married him, but she divorced him, and we never heard anything about that either. I think on the way that Clem wrote, there are a couple of things that you, that you want to think about. Uh, we used to laugh. We had lunch in the test kitchen left over from the Herald Tribune Home Institute from the old days. Us girls had lunch out there, and if we had leftover time, we played canasta, and it sure was a lot cheaper than going out to lunch, and we didn't make a lot of money. But the whole argument about how the test kitchen was there and how the test kitchen was going to be used, some days, you know, just really went out of the place. And why did I get off on that topic? <laughs> I, I don't know. But, uh, You're talking about how you used to make fun of her. We would sit there, thank you, we, thank you very much. Can I, send you, can I send you a check? You've done enough. I mean, when you forget names, it's really bad, but when you forget plots, you're really in trouble. But we would sit out there in the kitchen and we would gossip and we would laugh about Clem's writing because it was florid and purple. And we thought, and you, she wrote by hand. And then you would see her come out with these long sheets, and there would be overwriting on the overwriting, and her secretary would sit down and retype it before it went off to the composing room to the editor. And it was honey to the bee as far as the reader went, and we didn't know squat about what was going on. We, of course, were thinking about our nice objective news leads and our occasional clever moments, but Clem was writing to the readers who understood about food. And uh, if you ask us later on, we'll talk about who edited Clementine. Coleman? It wasn't me, <laughs> honest. Um, yeah, I... Um, as Kelly has suggested, I was familiar with the name Clementine Paddleford, but I'd never read her. I knew nothing about her. My orientation, uh, my, my introduction to food, I should say, uh, unlike that of, of many, probably many of you, and I'm not sure about those at this table, but it was, not, it was never through the kitchen. It was through the restaurant table. 
Uh, I grew up in Southern California. My parents were um, the perfect restaurant going couple because my mother couldn't cook and my dad made pretty good money in the movie studios. So they went out to dinner all the time and they took me with them from the time I was literally a babe in arms. So my orientation to, to food really came from sitting there and having people bring it to me rather than, uh, than going out and having to cook it. Uh, that translated when I started realizing that I was very interested in food uh, for reasons beyond just filling my belly, uh, although I was very good at that, obviously, um, was uh, I, I gravitated toward, I guess you could say, the, the literary food writers. Uh, Joseph Wexberg was a, was a favorite of mine, and um, Waverly Root, who was a, a little bit later, but uh, who wrote these two wonderful books, one of which I've just been using uh, quite a bit for research, called The Food of Italy and The Food of France, neither one of which has a single recipe in it, and they're big, thick books, uh, but he describes food. And, and uh, Ludwig Bemelmans, who you may know as the author of, of the Madeleine books, but who also wrote some wonderful things about food. But, but this was all from, uh, from, the, from the table point of view. And I, I never... I won't say I never read, but uh, I, I didn't have much interest in newspaper food sections. Um, I, this, was a, this happened a, a little bit later, but before Ruth Reichel took over the food section of the Los Angeles Times, the, I won't mention the names of the people that were involved, but it had a certain sensibility to it. And I, I thought that sensibility was best defined by a letter, they, they had a column, as uh, many food sections do, of people, re uh, readers writing in with questions. How do I make such and such? How do I keep my souffle from falling? And so forth. And they would all be answered uh, by their panel of experts. And one of the readers wrote in and, and said, uh, I noticed that your recipes frequently call for leftover chicken. I'm interested in knowing how to get chicken to the point where it qualifies as leftover chicken. <laughs> And, and they gave a straight answer for it. Which, and I said, I said, why am I reading this? This, 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 has, this doesn't interest me at all. So I, um, e even if I had lived in New York, uh, it's doubtful. Um, and I'm, well, I'm old enough to probably have started reading uh, her when she was, Clementine, when she was still writing in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, it's doubtful that I would have read her anyway. So many years later, uh, myself and some other people who thought we were being very smart and very original said, we don't like all these other food magazines, we're going to start a food magazine that, is, that does something no one has ever done before. Uh, which is, uh, and, and I, I wrote, um, I, I don't usually admit this in, in public, but I have actually used PowerPoint and uh, I was asked by the people that owned uh, Severa, which was the, the magazine we started, at some point if I would um, uh, make some PowerPoint, uh, a PowerPoint presentation of what I thought the magazine should be. And, and this is what I wrote down, and, and this, this was 1994. Okay, it's about the history and traditions of food, the rituals of preparation and of dining, the passionate personalities who create the things we eat and drink, the ingredients and products we know and love and those we want to discover, the origins of those ingredients and products, our family and cultural roots, and the environment we live in and draw nourishment from. All right, so we, we thought we were uh, very, very clever and very original. Um, some years into the history of Sever, uh, Ms. Alexander, who was uh, actually you had several lives there. Originally, a, a an online editor, and then uh, then a, a senior editor, senior editor and writer. Uh, most of the editors there, myself included, did a lot of writing, and um, and we we were lucky to have people that were quite good at what they did, including Kelly. And so she, as she said, she came to me one day and said, you know, have you ever heard of Clementine Paddleford? And I said vaguely, and I want to do this story, and I, there's this archive in Manhattan, Kansas. And she didn't know this at the time, but Manhattan, Kansas kind of perked my interest because I have the, the, um, the cemeteries in Manhattan and Powhatan, which is nearby, are full of Andrews's. Uh, my, part of my family was, my father was actually uh, brought up in St. Joe. Uh, Missouri, but uh, th that area was where my family came from and my father's family. So I, I won't say that's the only reason, but I, I said, okay, well, and as she pointed out, it was cheap to get there compared to, uh, to Paris <laughs> and Tokyo. And then, of course, w once I'd assigned the piece and said she could go ahead and do it, I figured I'd, I'd better see what this, uh, what this Paddleford was all about. So I, I never read Clementine Paddleford until probably, what, what year did you start? 2001. 2001, something like that. So I'm, I'm a latecomer to it. And, and of course, the, the reason I shared those PowerPoints with you earlier is I started reading this book and, and I said, you know, you could have put all those PowerPoints on the back of the book as a blurb or something. It described uh, 
20, 30, 40 years before we did what we did, she had already been doing this. And so we, we weren't quite so clever and innovative as, as we thought. And wh when I started reading her, I, I found, well, it, there's been reference to, to her prose style. And you know, I, there's this great uh, thing where she says, for instance, deep in the heart of Texas, I made San Antonio my headquarters for junketing jaunts, rustling up ranch recipes. So there was a lot of that kind of writing. <laughs> And um, a lot of alliteration, I noticed, and, and uh, you know, so it was, in a sense, it was kind of hard going. But then, the, the people and the places she was going, and, and she really was going on the submarines and going to farms, and, and uh, she went, um, she had a, a line, I'm gonna quote that Kelly didn't quote, but it's similar to what you were talking about. She um, uh, wanted some recipes for Christmas cookies, and uh, a friend of hers um, in, Abilene had uh, used to send her cookies, and so she wanted to, uh, to go back and find the recipe firsthand, went back to Abilene, uh, Abilene, Kansas, and, um, and she said uh, that th that city was a, a place where the best recipes are hand-downs from mothers to daughters, from neighbor to neighbor, along with those country counting out rhymes which children teach to children. And I said, wow, that's, that's a, a great way of, of expressing it. It's, she was conscious of food and of recipes, and, and recipes not necessarily meaning, you know, 3.2 liters of this and, and, and whatever, whatever, but recipes being how, what goes into this dish, how you make this dish, that, that that's a kind of cultural knowledge and cultural heritage that, uh, that is extremely important and has always been passed down from generation to generation. And, and if, it, if it isn't anymore being passed down that way, and if we think we can learn it from, uh, from watching it on TV, uh, well, that, that's, that, then we're losing something that's very important. Uh, Kelly quoted um, the chef who said, um, I just want to make it regional. Uh, the, the other thing that, that I hear chefs say all the time, and we talk about a traditional dish like, I don't know, bouillabaisse or, or chili con carne, since we're talking about American, you know, Texas chili, and it, it'll have some weird ingredient or, or something completely different, and you ask the chef about it, and the chef will say, oh, well, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm trying to be authentic here, but I wanted to make it mine, and I want to say, it's not yours, you know, you're, you're perfectly free as a creative individual to do whatever you want, but then you're not making chili con carne or Texas chili anymore, and, and you shouldn't pretend that you are, and, and I think, um, when you read Clementine uh, tracking people down, um, oh God, they, there's a thing about uh, <laughs> visiting the um, a woman who was the daughter of the dean of the Pennsylvania mushroom industry, and she wanted to find out what their favorite mushroom dish was, and it turned out it was it was cream chip beef with mushrooms on, <laughs> on toast, and, and served over waffles, <laughs> and that you know it, it actually does sound good. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, and to, to do that, and okay, so that's in a sense a kind of somebody making it theirs, but it wasn't somebody making it theirs because they wanted to impress uh, diners, they wanted to get reviewed by, by a restaurant critic or something like that. It's because, again, that's what they had, that's what they liked. Uh, you know, they had plenty of mushrooms, so they probably thought of every possible way to use mushrooms, and, and uh, they probably made mushroom ice cream, I don't know. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> but the, the thing that, that she really seemed to understand and what, very, what, what impressed me greatly was that the fact that food, that dishes that people prepare are not abstracts. They're, they're not things that, that people, um, or they shouldn't be, that people sit around and look at a, a few artichokes or, the, or they look at, a, at some ground beef or they, or they look at some shrimp or something and say, you know, what could I possibly do with this? Let's see, what if I do this, what if I do that? That's a certain kind of cooking and, and I can't say that it's always wrong, especially as the author of a forthcoming biography of Ferran Adria who would, would take those ingredients and take them off into outer space. But I think it's vital to a culture and to, to a nation uh, and to, to the people of a country uh, or a place, a uh, smaller place, to recognize that the way they cook and the reason they make things in a certain way and not another way and use certain ingredients and not other ingredients is really part of their, part of their culture. It's part of what connects them 
with their families, with their homes, with their religion in some cases, with, with uh, the past, with their environment. And much to my surprise, this newspaper food writer, um, 40 some years ago, understood this. And I, having read the books, uh, having read How America Eats specifically, I can't imagine why she became forgotten. I, I can't imagine why she drifted out of, uh, out of favor. Uh, I'm, I'm frankly very surprised, and I, I think, I hope that events like this in Kelly's book will help to restore her reputation. I hope you'll all go out and tell people they ought to read this wonderful woman. Um, well, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the reasons that Clementine Pettelford did fall out of fashion and was briefly forgotten. Um, but first, I'll talk about how I discovered Clementine Pettelford and why I connected with her. Um, for the past 10 years, I've been traveling around America collecting oral histories and recipes to create a portrait of America at the table. And as part of doing that, I, read, I, I just sat and read for a couple years before even going out. And that's, that resulted in the book that I edited for the Library of America about American food writing. And um, I'd had a Clementine Paddleford book. I was given a few books when I was quite young and um, had shown an interest in cooking, um, what I'd shown an interest in was giving salons in central Ohio where artistic people could gather and, and I would cook. I would cook things like Allen Ginsberg would come and he wanted brown rice and not knowing what brown rice was, I made rice aroni because it looked brown on the package. And um, people had given me some books and Clementine and, and How America Eats was one of those as, was, um, the, as were the Waverly Root books and um, a wonderful book about seasonal cooking um, by that blind man. Roy de Groot. Roy de Groot. Oh my gosh, that was great. An um, appetite for every season or something. Um, and, and so I knew about her work and, and liked it quite a lot because what I found in her work was uh, a fellow Midwesterner who had gone to the big city but had not really forgotten or betrayed the heart of the country. She continued to return to the heart of the country. She never really bought into the New York myth of itself as having invented America. She understood that New York packaged America. And she would go out into America and bring back to New York City, the things that she found. Now, this woman was insane. She drove her own plane. I mean, she flew her own plane. She was out. It, she, she'd go to cowboy camps. She'd go down into mining companies. She'd go to lumbering camps. She was, she was a major adventurer. Within the context of food writing, um, she, was, she, she sort of held both parts of it. Newspapers were not always independent. I know that that will be shocking you know, to people. Um, and the food pages were particularly corrupt and particularly owned by the food industry. And when Clem began writing, this was absolutely the case. Armour owned, Campbell's owned it. Who, you know, somebody bought the whole section. And, and you basically were working for Campbell's that week. Well, Clem came in and decided, geez, you know, I, you know, I don't, I, I'll live in the subsidized environment, but I will also begin to show what a little bit of enterprise can do. I can. And um, she, she really left her desk and went out and did the work. And I so admire that. It was original work. She never stopped reporting and writing. Now, there are a lot of things that we can say about, about Clem. She is no angel. None of these people are angels. She shilled. Why was she the Martha Stewart of her age? Not because of what she was making at the newspaper, sweetheart. She was selling product. She was endorsing things. That's where she made her money. She made a reputation in the newspapers and magazines, but she made her money endorsing food products and implements and things like that. 
Um, we wouldn't like that today. We wouldn't approve of it today until she's earned her stripes and then she goes out and has her own line of food. That's okay. I don't know how that calculus works, but there, it, it, there's a, a kind of approval giving that, that um, Clem wouldn't have gotten. Um, didn't bother Clem. She was the Martha Stewart of her day. And she went out and really did the work, made the money, came back, and, and published significantly. Now, she distinguished herself at a time when, when the role of women in newspapers was fairly circumspect. And Betsy can talk more to this, because what I know is secondhand. Um, until about the 1960s, female food, there were two kinds of food writers. There were these fabulous kind of Lucius Beebe's and all of these people who, who went out as the great bon voyage and they had ton, that their, their expense account was so heavy they could barely walk. Their, they had so much gold in their pants. And they, they went out and they did great adventures and they ate and they drank and they wrote about it. They discovered the world. They were out there in the world discovering it. And then there were these little minions that were all women back on 43rd Street or 36th Street or wherever the newspapers were or the magazines were, and, and they were home economists. They had a home economist head, and they were the ones assigned to making everything work and making sure that America had its turkey at Thanksgiving and had its fried chicken on the 4th of July and had its first run of salmon when it was presented to the president, and had, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Clem was in between. She was out in the world, yet she still wrote like a girl. She was out in the world, but she was still reporting on the world of women and reporting on the private sphere. Yes, she got on the submarine. Yes, she went to the lumber camp. But more, she, she more or less was an eye in the home kitchen. She was, she was using food as a way of looking at private life in America and as a way of looking at the role of women in America. Now, she never would have said that, but that is the effect of her work. So there she is, and I mean, the, she, you couldn't shut her up. She was in, intensely prolific. And so it goes on and on and on. And then all of a sudden, her newspaper's starting to slide, and this thing called the New York Times is starting to rise. And at the New York Times, there is a young man from Sunflower, Mississippi, whose name is Craig Claiborne. And Craig can write like a dream. And Craig has gone to hotel school, and Craig is fabulous, and he is living in a kind of fabulous Manhattan dream, not of home cooking, but of chef-inspired fabulousness. And Craig begins to write aspirationally. He's where we all want to be, and so through him we can see it. Well, who wants to go hang out with Granny in Manhattan, Kansas? If you can go hang out at the French Pavilion at the World's Fair, if you can find out the secrets to that these great men are doing. So the, sh the pendulum shifted at that point from doing and from um, enabling and supporting the preparation of dinner to turn the, the early underpinnings of food porn of making, uh, making the learning and the presentation an end in and of itself. So Craig owned that world, and Craig soon owned the upper middle class, because that's who the New York Times owned. And, and Clem was on a train that, that had gone into a tunnel and was not going to come out. So why did Clementine Paddleford get forgotten? There are a number of reasons. Number one the first visible women who walked out of the kitchen and, and braved that former man's world I, really was Gail Green. And she did it by being about sex. Clem was not about sex. That was way, way far off of her radar. Um, it, it was a different time. 
the women who were out there, first Gail, then Mimi, then Ruth, there was a whole band of women who finally said, forget it, I'm not staying in here making recipes, I'm not interested in recipes, I want my expense account. I have just as much to say about a restaurant as anybody else and I know what I'm talking about. And braved it and had opinions and did their enterprise. Those are the people that became, that did what Clem could have done had Clem been 37 rather than 70 when the world began to shift. She was a casualty of her time. She wasn't a casualty of herself. She was a casualty of what happened to women and what happened in the world of food in a pre-feminist, pre-sexual revolution era. So why are we thinking of her now? I, I think one of the reasons we're thinking of her now is because the more we lose home cooking, the more we romanticize it. The more that we get re removed from the home kitchen, the more we think we would be a better person if we were back in the home kitchen. Um, I did this story a few years ago for the New Yorker about trophy stoves, and we did a survey and found that <laughs> the less people used their stoves, the more they paid for them. There was an inverse, it was a temple, it was like this temple to good intention. And, and we're shifting and I think that we're seeing it on, on shows like Top Chef, where how, how much really, how, how long really can intelligent people pretend that a recipe is that fascinating? <laughs> it's not. The people who make it are fascinating the moments in which there's an incredible symphony of place and intention and society and connection, that's fascinating. But you can't write that down in tablespoons and teaspoons and, and, and weights and measures. Clem got that. And so why are we interested in her today? Because we're shifting back. Because we've almost ridden the recipe horse as far as it can go. We've almost ridden the chef as demigod, as far as we can go. We're starting to worry about what we're missing at home, and all of this is greatly aided by the fact that we no longer have expense accounts. Thanks. <laughs> Before I give you an opportunity to ask a question or, or make a statement, I, I, I wanted to follow up on Molly's comments. What was the relationship between Craig Claiborne and Clementine Paddleford? Uh, uh, Kelly, do you want to you want to respond, or Molly? Well, Molly? I had talked to, to Kelly actually when you were doing the book because at that time I had been reading a lot for the um, American Food Writing book, and I was actually shocked when I was reading early Craig Claiborne on microfilm over on 41st or 30, when it, this dusty old repository. This was before stuff had been put up online. And I was shocked to see how many of Clem's stories appeared under Craig's name. He robbed her. He robbed her blind. He took her people. He took her recipes. He, I would not say he took her reporting, because he was a good reporter, and he had a lot of integrity. But I would say that two things. Clem was in the air. And when something's in the air, you really, who owns an idea? I'm not sure. I, I always figure, once I've written something, I no longer own it. Um, Clem did not share that point of view. And uh, yeah. Um, Clementine was this unusual woman of power where she was really invested in helping other younger women, Betsy Wade being case in point. Like there's so many uh, stories that you hear about women who have achieved a certain amount of power and they're trying to push back the people coming up. Clem was like pulling them up. She was great. But the one person when I um, interviewed her adopted daughter who she said Clem really didn't like in the world of food was Craig Claiborne. And she wouldn't tell me why, which was annoying. So I had to find out why. And one of the things I did was compare stories, just side by side articles. And the one that always sticks in my mind is there was a store in Yorktown, uptown on the east side, called Paprikash Weiss. Oh, yeah. It's great Hungarian importing. So can you tell a lot about Hungarian food today? Yeah, yeah. Um, so 
uh, Clem had written about this story and she'd written about the family and their efforts to import authentic paprika and this thing. And, you know, three weeks later, Craig wrote the same goddamn story. So it was, and it was really the There same were whole story. phrases. It would not get by a copy editor today. So you could see where she was very irritated. And I think that, um, I think a lot of it came from knowing she was just on the wrong horse. Clementine at that point was in her mid to late 60s. The financial troubles of the Herald Tribune were really well known. The New York Times was really on the rise. Craig Claiborne came in and he was very young and fresh faced and was really reinventing kind of restaurant criticism in a certain way. And I think she felt she couldn't compete and then she kept noticing him lifting her work and she was really mad about it's it. It's painful. Yeah. So that's who she perceived as her main rival and she was, I mean, not what we would consider an old lady, but she was an old person when she was 65. She was sick. She had had laryngeal cancer as a young woman. She was not a young 65. And there was this really young guy who was having a great time doing what she did, and she yeah. was very angry. Yeah. I, listen, I want to put my spoon in here, too, if I as can As the only person get who knew it. them both, you mean? Well. <laughs> and edited them both? <laughs> edited them both. But uh, I want to tell you that when Craig came to the New York Times, which was after I went to the New York Times, he could not write very well. So if you were reading down in the archives in the dust, you were reading the struggle between Craig coming in covered with a rash because he was so nervous, saying, I can't seem to make this sound like a story, Betsy, what should I do? He was just having a terrible time learning to write. And Clem, while I would not describe her writing as fluent, uh, it flowed out pretty well, and she could talk it through and get her secretary to type it down again. So you were dealing with a young man on the rise who had gotten a job that he really wanted, that he wasn't sure he was going to get, and I was one of his references, uh, because I had known him when he was a PR guy back when I worked for Scripps Howard, and a woman at the fullness of her powers, but who was on a paper that really could not sustain her. And before even the Herald Tribune went under this week, which was the Sunday supplement, where all the big dough was, the big color advertising for the armor hams uh, and the lovely Bisquick biscuits popping out on the back cover, that went. And New York Magazine was what came in behind it. Uh, so you had Clem looking at a tremendous loss uh, from the standpoint of her circulation, her national circulation, and her knowledge. So you, you, you had an unenviable position for her, I think. Thank you. Uh, I want to give, there were two of you who raised your hand when we asked uh, if you knew Clementine Battleford. Do you wish, do you, I don't want to, uh, do, you, do you wish to make a statement at all? She's got a very bad voice, but. We have a microphone. And we'd love to know her name. And we, if, if you could give your name, please. Her name is Chris Pines, okay. very good friend of Cecily's, very good friend of, uh, and new Clementine. I'm not sure why or how. Just working with her. Just working with her. At J. Walter Thompson. Okay. Anybody else know, know her and want to say something? Well, two. So, Kelly, you, you lost I, the bet. I did. So, all right. So, thank well, you. I don't know that you won it. I didn't win anything. <laughs> it's not an I, I won nothing here, but we got two. Uh, we're thank now you. open for questions. If you can, you have to come up to the microphone or get a microphone. So, uh, we have two people walking around with microphones. And if you could give your name first, that would be appreciated. My name's Sylvia Carter, and I've heard some of Betsy's stories in the past, and I would love to hear the story of Pussy Willow, the cat who loved to sit in the in basket, and what happened. I, I, I stand up for you, Sylvia Carter. How lovely to see one of the finest food writers in the world in here with us. Speak into the microphone. Speak into the microphone. Sylvia Carter had a long and fine career, I think. You've all read her at Newsday, and uh, she has made our lives a great deal more entertaining than they would otherwise have been. <laughs> um, when Clementine Paddleford came into the office in the morning from the building she owned on the east side, uh, she arrived in capes and cloaks, uh, which Kelly has described beautifully in the book, and don't miss reading this part of it. And she kind of floated in, 
and she had things flung over her shoulder, and she had bags that were full of paper and manuscripts and pencils, and she had a cat. <laughs> and she had an office way back at the back of the ninth floor of the Herald Tribune. If you go up to the New York Times cafeteria and look straight across, you can look down into what used to be Clementine Paddleford's office at the very back of the building, it sticks out. And she would put Pussy Willow down into the inbox. <laughs> and Pussy Willow would sit in the sun while Clem worked. Uh, unfortunately, when Joan Cook and I wrote Clem's obituary for the Times, we made an error. It turns out it was not Pussy Willow who was in the inbox that day. It was another... No, oh, it was Prince Peter, of course. Prince Peter happened to be in the inbox that day. But she had wanted to bury Prince Peter in the place that he loved to rest in. So they took the inbox and they took it up to the Valhalla for cats, wherever that is, and they buried poor Prince Peter with much wailing and gnashing of teeth uh, in one of the finer, I have no doubt, cat sites of the world. <laughs> and Clem came back to the office and said, where's the manuscript? <laughs> and they went back and they exhumed <laughs> Prince Peter. <laughs> I, I don't know how we can top that. <laughs> Another question or comment? Hi, uh, my name's Jennifer Mulligan. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, I'm just an amateur cook, and I didn't know anything about Clementine before today. Uh, my question is, there's been a resurgence with um, uh, Julia Child's cookbook. Is there any chance that her Clementine's cookbook will be republished? That's such a good question. Um, Chase Bank owns the rights to How America Eats, and there's currently um, a small movement <laughs> to try to get them to either release them or reissue the book. But it's really, I mean, they, they don't perceive it as like a gigantic moneymaker, so there's not a lot of movement <laughs> happening on that. But we've been working on it for a few years. I mean, it would be wonderful to just reintroduce how America eats, even in its form as is. So we'll see what happens. It's ongoing. I should, start, I should start some kind of Facebook page if I was so inclined. If I were the people at Chase, I would look at the price on Abe Books because it is not cheap. How many of you have copies of? Any of you have copies of the book? It's selling now at four hundred dollars. I thought I just mentioned that as an investment. You made a good choice. <laughs> um, so maybe uh, we could talk with Meryl Streep about playing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? I would like to thank the uh, panelists. I thought they were wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>